Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Dharma and I members and our fellow information professionals, peers, and uh, guests. Uh, as we start, I would like to acknowledge Nanmal people, uh, traditional custodians of the land where we work and where we meet tonight, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We are excited to have you all here as the start of a new uh, community of practice that I am in Dharma plan to establish in this town. The idea started long ago, about a year ago, when we were discussing uh, the Information Awareness Month. I need to show hands who knows about Information Awareness Month in this room. We need to change that, so we all <laughs> need to know about that. So for 14 years now, uh, the associations like Dharma and IM and many others, which used to step on each other's toes and confuse the hell out of our members, talking about the same thing in different language, uh, including mine, as obviously, with, with a strong accent, um, we decided to get together at least in a month during the, 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 the year and talk same language to same topics and to, to all of our audience in the same way. So in the same uh, context, we have run an event uh, in May called Many Voices, One Message, where quite a few hot topics in information management were um, discussed and uh, uh, artificial intelligence was one of them. It was very, very popular. We had a lot of people coming to the table with uh, all sorts of st thoughts. And as a result, we have published uh, co collectively all the associations, including Dharma, IAM, um, National Archives, uh, RIMFA, Erlin, Aglin, and a few others. We produced a brochure that gives a little bit of a feedback to our community what we discussed in those days. As a result of that awesome uh, event, uh, Dharma and I am got together. We signed a memorandum of understanding to start doing what we probably should have done a long time ago because data doesn't make sense without information and information cannot live without data. So we should work together and bring more of the content together. And I don't know if you want to take okay. a word. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's a Yes, I think it's a long overdue. I think we've actually been talking about this for many years now, about working better together, so it's finally sort of happened. Um, we had the topics around AI and, um, and machine learning and things like that, because this might encourage people to improve the quality of their data, <laughs> um, which unfortunately in government, we still don't have much attention about that yet. So if you, if you would have seen on your chairs, they had a, a, a flyer about the, you know, the Dharma as a certified data management professional qualification. So I just want to say a few words about that, and it's, it's very important to think of data literacy and things like that for people to actually be on the same page around data, if they're going to work with artificial intelligence and things like that. So take the, uh, the fly away uh, with you and think about it and get back in touch if you'd like to find out more. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. As you know, garbage in, garbage out, that hasn't changed even with artificial intelligence. If you don't have right data, you're unlikely to come with the right intelligence. So today we have a very exciting program to start. Uh, this is first in a series of, of our seminars. We have Tony Krijan that I'm going to introduce in a minute as our keynote speaker, Neil Britliff, Jovan Stojano, which is going to join us from Europe, and then finally Anthony Boyle, uh, who represents uh, Automated Reasoning Alliance, a sponsor of our event tonight. <coughs> so um, I'm also going to talk later about the next event, but. Let's start with this one first. So our first guest of the night is uh, Tony Krijan, who I know for many years as a CFO and CIO of the National Health uh, and Research, National Health and Medical Research Council, full name, it's like uh, some technology, very long name. But uh, uh, we had many, many very truthful dialogues related to artificial intelligence and I've heard Tony speak in, on many occasions, and I look forward to hearing him tonight. Tony, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm genuinely honoured to have the opportunity to address you. Um, I think the reason why I, I do come out and talk is because NHMRC is just a small little agency that's having a bit of a go, and, and one of the things that uh, I'm trying to do, I'm passionate about uh, making, making things, things better, faster, faster uh, uh, cheaper. cheaper. That's, that's the CFO, CFO talking. talking. But um, so it, it's genuinely an honour, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can keep people interested at this late hour. First of all, I would like to say a little bit about NHMRC uh, because you do need the context to work out why why are we doing this. And basically, uh, we're a material health, um, health portfolio agency. That means that we deal with a lot of money. It's finance speak. And we have a, quite a, an unusually wide range of responsibilities for the provision of health advice, uh, leadership and ethical, in ethical research frameworks, boosting dementia, fostering translation of research into uh, policy and practice, regulation, uh, en enacting certain bits of regulation of human embryo research. And in fact, um, you know, our investment, in fact, uh, is going up to over $900 million a year from this year. And at any one point in time, we've got about $1.8 billion in contracts. So the health and medical research sector is quite a, a substantial sector in Australia. Uh, we leverage... Uh, the intellectual capital of scientists and um, researchers across Australia, and that's through uh, hundreds of council and committee members. We engage um, thousands of uh, expert reviewers uh, on panels and, and remotely every year. And we have um, research activity in Australia is extraordinary. Um, uh, NHMRC funded grants outperform uh, on a citation basis uh, against the world average by um, 68%, so Australian health and medical research is genuinely stellar. And one of the things we're able to do is leverage that. Uh, but we face a number of change drivers, and those change drivers are around government policy and legislation to leverage data, that's understandable. Uh, there are certainly government expectations about re uh, return on investment, and that's um, not just government, that the public have every right to have those expectations. Uh, citizens expect amenity, they expect a, a data safety and a privacy. Uh, in other words, that their data is protected. Uh, I can tell you that the health and medical research sector, that brilliant sector, they can be quite demanding and they, they expect us to give them, uh, to reduce the application burden because peer review is about uh, that and that we used to get them to do a lot of the administration and that's one of the motives to, to try and use uh, robotic process automation uh, to try and re relieve the burden, um, and also that assessment burden. Uh, in a world where data exists, we really got to embrace tell it once. It's not just the government's policy of tell us once. The data exists somewhere in the web sphere, and, and there is, we have technology, there is widely available technology that means you can scrape it from wherever it is, uh, lies. Uh, they Certainly in terms of our granting system, they want a simple and intuitive system and, and look, there's a, there's a massive international trend towards open data, and that's going to bring new challenges. There, there are, uh, our government is currently preparing legislation, and that's about opening up data uh, for use and reuse. Internal drivers are, are normal. I think every organisation has got that, and that is uh, to better demonstrate our ongoing value proposition uh, as an agency that's government funded. Uh, we also uh, want to increase our operational effectiveness um, and our efficiency, of course. Um, so the interesting thing about the National Health and Medical Research Council is we've, got, we've had an externally facing end-to-end -end digital workflow system in our grants, um, uh, grant administration system for the best part of 10 years. Internally, however, we, even though our rec records are digital, we're still working through a, a, a range of legacy issues around that are basically analog processes and you know they manifest as um, uh, things like wet forms and, and just you know passing a digital lens through that history of that, that analog history is really hard so it's very it's very interesting the reason obviously why invested external um, electronic workflow is because our citizenry comes first we're now trying to get the back office sorted um, uh, one, one of the challenges we're facing though is re recently we rolled out always on uh, virtual private network laptops so that basically wherever we go uh, we're always connected to our, um, uh, our network and, and that increases flexibility but one of the things it's doing is apart from rapidly moving us away from 
uh, any kind of paper. It's the, the actual amount of data we're collecting is just phenomenal. And it's, it, on campus, it's overwhelming. And so one of the things that we are already starting to think about is how do you manage um, and, and cope with all of that uh, to ensure there's an enhanced vi visibility and a management capability? Data has to have, uh, there needs to be a metadata so that um, it's, it's, all the data is described, um, its value and its lifespan needs, need to be understood. Uh, we need systematically uh, the ability to govern it and um, uh, it needs to be obviously suitably stored and preserved so you can manage it, eventually sentence it. Uh, but in the meantime, it's got to be available to be used and reused. Um, so we've got plenty of challenges. As you can see here, this is uh, not intended for you to necessarily read it, but it's an example that um, our data governance um, uh, internal control framework is based around risk and compliance, cyber security and infrastructure management, uh, the privacy of data and, and data protection, uh, e-discovery, data management, information and records management, and of course there's uh, data analytics and business value um, uh, generation. So to give you a couple of um, examples of what we're, we're, we're doing, uh, proofs of concept and, and how we're starting to um, delve into uh, RPA, machine learning um, and, and intelligence, uh, uh, creation of intelligence through technology. Um, one of the things we did, and, and uh, my colleague here, Neil, is going to speak, he worked, uh, worked with us on digitising our council records. It's very, very exciting. They go back to 1937. And you need to understand that um, things that are in paper, particularly vast volumes of books, it's dark data. For us to be able to work with Neil and Microsoft and, you know, to be able to uh, start to unlock that meant that uh, we were able to... Um, we're now able to extract value out of that. One of the things we're also doing differently, uh, unlike many organisations, before we destroy our records, we're actually digitising them. And we have digitised tens of thousands of records because we intend to mine all, mine all of that. Um, one of the things we found that's a really positive message is in the process of building our in-house text ca um, analytics capability, we were able to do exploratory uh, <coughs> proofs of concept. And we found that, for example, you can use commercial off-the-shelf software products, um, open source software, and code libraries to actually be able to perform text e extraction and topic analysis, for example. But, um, and as one of our forays was that um, we need, would need to classify a really sophisticated, fresh data set every year. We get 5,000 applications. Minister of Government, or my CEO, wants to know uh, how much value or how much are we spent or how much are we committing around, say, cancer? Rare cancers, it can be any one of, um, any one of uh, um, many, many uh, burdens of disease. Now, we, the first proof of concept we did internally, we're actually able to show that we could classify seven different cancer types with a 92 to 95% accuracy. Given that was our first foray into that, we now have a business model. And one of the things I'm trying to do is we're exploring about how could we um, scale that knowledge, that model, to more than 1,500 uh, research topics. The ability to automatically machine read text, uh, that's transformative for an organisation like, like ourselves that, you know, we're very small, we have uh, $40 million per annum to run the whole shebang. And uh, that um, that's, uh, means we need to stretch that uh, uh, dollar quite a long way. One of the things we did uh, discover, though, um, PDFs and OCRs, just text analytics, it was really different for us. We're used to dealing with numbers and various things, but we had to do a lot of learning. Uh, handling text um, brings forward a whole lot of in, uh, challenges. Um, but our challenge, really, what we're planning to do, for example, if we can open up those council records, as an example, to the public, turn it into a searchable database. The number of PhDs that are waiting to be had and, and all that knowledge to be extracted, uh, quite extraordinary. There's also some maturity to be had because one of the things you discover is uh, our ex social expectations today uh, about how we talk about things, diseases, leprosy, and you know, um, different cultures. Uh, it was very different then. And so uh, there's always a bit of a sting in the tail when you start um, cast um, uh, casting a light on uh, dark data. 
One of our big challenges, just operationally, is the fact that um, health and medical research is in the media every single day, whether it's NHMRC or it's just health and medical research generally. And we get a vast amount of inquiries uh, externally from the Department of Health, from all over government, saying how much research in this or that. And that uh, amounts to thousands of extractions a year. That is a very manual process. It, and basically a third of that team's work, my data and analytics team, a third of their work is basically free for everybody else. And that's okay, because we're a public good entity. But our challenge is then to try and leverage technology to be able to um, extract that uh, more, in, more efficiently. And for example, one of the things that uh, my team did, uh, they've been experimenting with natural language processing, created their own categorization system around entity types and classifying relationships. And what they've been able to do is uh, essentially automatically be able to extract information uh, around the researcher, the grant institution, the field of research, so that when a press clip comes out, what, what our objective is to have the tool automatically scrape up the data from our, not only initially our data sets, but eventually to scrape more widely from the web and other sources, um, other materials, so that the decision maker has got a press clip in front of them, but they've also got all of the relevant, or the beginnings of all of the relevant information, and they can uh, write right there when they're starting to assess what are the implications of um, a particular press clip. Um, this is again, it's just demonstrative. The colours show that whether you're talking about cardinal numbers, ordinal numbers, uh, or classifying people or institutions, you, you have to develop a, um, a classification system, and behind that is fundamentally a numbers um, game. Uh, I'm not going to get into that tonight. Uh, one of the other challenges we have is, you know, when you're investing government funds, you need to invest well. If you're making a decision about how to change your program and what the impacts are, you need to make those changes, uh, decisions very carefully. Recently, we made a substantial um, change to our uh, eligibility rules um, under the what's called the new grant program. And um, one of the things we did a few years ago as we were thinking about that is it engaged um, data science, really advanced predictive modeling, to actually start to scope and, and infer likely and possible <laughs> outcomes. Now, because it was our first time, we've always done probability and statistics and what have you, so we've got a strong background in that. But this was a different game, you know, using genuine data science and, and with a higher level of um, intended accuracy. Now, it, it was pretty um, unnerving to make all of these predictions to the CEO, uh, but as it turns out, that data, those data predictions that we made in 2017 and 18 turned out to be highly accurate. Now, what we're moving towards as an organisation is all of our significant decisions now are fundamentally one way or another founded on uh, predictive modelling. Um, having said that, a note of caution to everybody, uh, regardless of how good your modelling is, um, historical data is, is never necessarily a good predictor of the future because there are behavioural economics issues, there's algorithmic programmer and machine learning bias and there are interpretive, interpretability challenges. Another example of how uh, we're deploying advanced analytics, um, and again, all of this is intended to demonstrate to you that uh, the potential is there and it's just a matter of um, uh, will, and I know you all know that, but it's about convincing our wider audience um, of that. And so we were faced with a, a property challenge where we were going to reduce our property footprint by 20%, and as part of that, we had to reduce our multifunctional um, functional, um, devices. Now, basically, that's photocopiers as in common parlance. Um, but there was quite a strong staff and executive concern about the loss of capability and um, convenience. Nobody wanted to stand in queues. So um, I encouraged my uh, IT people to, uh, using Splunk, analyse um, 600 megabytes of data, and we were able to produce an evidence base that actually, based on actual seasonally adjusted data, what that fostered was a, a discussion, and that intelligence um, enabled the compromise and um, further concessions, it really blew me away. We, we, the resistance turned to uh, quite a, it, people became very positive once they actually saw the stats, the data. And unlike um, statistics or predictive on sampling, this was real population data. We could actually show every single uh, use of the copier and basically almost what kind of uh, use it was. 
Uh, the beauty of that is now we've got a minimum level of redundancy. We don't have excess copiers. We've got enough redundancy for the seasonal pressures. And again, from a CFO perspective, uh, we halve the number of MFDs and we halve the cost of our um, uh, MFD contract. And again, this is an example where data is accessible. Um, you all know that uh, to deploy it in, in uh, operational uh, ways makes a lot of sense. Now, we all know that um, enterprise and data architecture is, um, ecosystems are complex. Um, you've got multiple vendor environment with an infrastructure platform and, so and um, uh, application software dimensions, and it encompasses web documents, records, um, digital assets, learning content, collaboration. There are so many different dimensions of data and information. And um, one of the things about that is, is that uh, EDRMS is, has its place in the world, um, but generally they're, they're often big, they're uh, hard to manage for a small organisation, can be difficult to afford. So one of the most recent things we did was uh, a proof of concept around a powerful, basically a semantic um, uh, technology uh, that enables us to get full visibility of our data and gives us, um, it's relatively low cost, and it can actually achieve a lot of the challenges, not only the administrative ones, but it enables um, potentially the business user to be able to very, very easily put up, pull up information about any topic they're after, provided the uh, metadata around it gives them privileges to see it. And that's one of the challenges in the deployment to make sure that you have those sort of controls. Um, so one of the things we're doing as an example is you know, we, we want to make it easier for our line areas to be able to do their day-to-day -day business. Obviously, we want to be able to support the process of discovery, uh, whether it's around public um, interest disclosure or freedom of information or government legislative disclosures. So um, that's an example of where we're currently exploring what to do because, uh, again, when you've got a limited budget, there's no point whinging. What we've got to do is to find, uh, find a way forward, and that way forward is using advanced analytics. So one of the big steps that we're taking right now is in that grant application process, our current grant system, which is um, in its, uh, almost in its 10th year, uh, has processed around, around $7 billion over nine years, more than 50,000 applications, 100,000 grant application assessments. And you know, to just give you an idea of the complexity, you've got thousands of applications, many more thousands of assessors, they have to be assigned to panels. Each um, application has uh, multiple spokespersons and external assessors. Uh, that is, independent experts that are not on the panel, but they uh, contribute to the peer review assessment. To give you an example further about how comp complex this is, uh, we recently, well, we rec recently had an, um, uh, a grant round of around 3,000 applications. It involved um, about 150,000 conflict of interest assessments to make sure that you have the right peer reviewer assessing the right application, often they're either competitors or they're collaborators. And there, there's a realm within which they can preside over the peer review, and there's a realm with each uh, at, at point where the conflict of interest means that they can't participate in the voting, for example. We manage that very, very closely. And so that, that's a really, really difficult process. The assignment process takes many, many hundreds of hours, and we've developed a new tool called um, the Grant Management Accelerator. It uses semantic analytics. It was developed by um, uh, our partner, Semantic Sciences, and it uses a low-level machine learning for application assignment. Now, why I say low-level machine learning, um, we, because we've got all this intelligence, we have an approach that we purposely make the uh, algorithms ingest knowledge, mainly because while it's able to ingest vast amounts of data, there's no need, we already have the expertise. Once we've loaded that up, we can actually add vast amounts of data to actually refine it over time. And by doing that, for example, we, we showed that with one scheme last year, uh, a scheme that took um, uh, 20 people about 500 hours to do that assignment process that I talked about above, um, that, uh, I'm just mindful of the time, I'll, I'll get a, a kick along. Um, we were able to show that one of our staff, uh, who's very familiar with both the business system, the IT system, was able to recreate it in, uh, in six hours with a 25% greater accuracy. And the actual two sets of algorithms, they, they can do the whole process in three seconds. Now, that, that's mind-blowing. 
our challenge now is to refine that further in the light of new knowledge that we've got. Um, and eventually we're, we're now starting to uh, do that and we're starting to look at rolling that out across all of our standard operating procedures. Uh, it's early days, but it's an example of the potential. Mindful of the time, I'll just say that we're also using it for outcome reporting. Uh, outcomes take 20 years, uh, often um, usually from uh, what's called bench to bedside and then to commercialisation, it can take even longer. Uh, we, got, we have lots of data around people who are applying for funds, but what happens to them afterwards? How do you detect an outcome? How can you report an outcome? Government wants to know that. And so we're using that same uh, semantic analytics technology. Um, and we did a proof of concept, scanned uh, 1,105 new pat uh, patents that were previously undetected, and just then had a market capitalisation of $860 million. Now what that says is it's worth going to the effort because government and the citizenry, they want to know where is health and medical research landing. Um, we're also connecting up, we're already connected to Trove, we're connecting up to IP Australia, the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, we've got ORCID links and we're looking to uh, connect up um, to WIPO. Now while the technology's got powerful web, web scraping capability, if you've already got data that's uh, proven, uh, why not link to it? Um, it just makes life easier in the long run. We are doing some case studies, um, again, not intended for you to read it, but it's an example. They're on our website, just um, type in case studies. But one of the things we discovered um, down the bottom on the timeline is all the time where whether they got a grant from ourselves, we can detect the ARC, we can detect TDA approvals and what have you. Uh, but what happens when they're outside? How do you know a, a product is being commercialised when, when they're not within our data system? And that's where we intend to deploy this technology uh, into the future to be able to basically, we don't have to ask um, researchers, what we can actually do is use the power of analytics to go out and detect it and, and link it back to our grants. We can then follow up through quality assurance mechanisms and double check until eventually we've refined the algorithms uh, to where we're always confident. This purpose is about uh, refining algorithms because we're discovering where is the data uh, that we're missing, because the first time we did this, it was a pretty dirty data set, it was large, and we had to do a lot of manual cleaning and, and obviously refining. So the short version of the then and now is, in the early noughties, we used to be paper-based. We did all of this manually. Um, and um, we've gone from an end-to-end -end grant management system that's been good, clunky, in the sense that it's not user-friendly. We're now deploying a new grant system, Sapphire, that includes machine learning, and, and look, we're, we're showing that as an organisation, we can change. There's nothing miraculous about it. We're just having a go. Um, advanced analytics, uh, three years ago, like many organisations, we just routinely did our own data, statistics, uh, um, and we used Excel and SQL. We now have an extraordinary suite of data science um, uh, techniques that we use. We engage experts um, as we need, and. Uh, what you know the message to you and more broadly is is that it's there we just have to start using it and you know there's there is nothing miraculously about it we're, now we're routinely doing optimization predictive modeling and with a high degree of confidence and again the message is we, we all need to have a go we have to have the courage to to just commit to doing it why because there is a real imperative to change NHMRC is very um, uh, concerned about continuing to demonstrate its value proposition on an ongoing basis. Um, and while we all know that data is a, a given uh, for knowledge creation, but to apply it routinely in operations and intelligence um, creation through advanced analytics, the RPA, the ML, uh, we need to, uh, you know, that's, that's the new opportunity. Some really hard lessons. We did have a low market knowledge and scanning. Um, the market scanning really did require some time to understand what was available. And um, discovering who can actually deliver on what they promise. It, it's, in, in the end, it is trial and error. Um, one of the things we found was uh, we used proof to concept because um, we certainly it's evident that using RFQs and RFTs can lock you in and you've got to be careful. It's not to say that they're not right, but it just for an organisation like ours where you're discovering what you don't know, you've got to tread lightly and, um, and that's, we did it through POX. Um, the hardest thing of all was develop, actually identifying the um, high value use case because there are so many things you could apply this to. 
working out where you're going to spend your money is it actually takes a bit of time. But um, once you understand the pattern, it's then after that easier to under, um, to do. There is no magic. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, Vladimir, uh, Vladimir, that uh, you need uh, well thought out re re um, reasoning. Algorithms are another tool set. Uh, unlike expert knowledge systems, which were popular in the 90s, uh, RPA, NLP, ML, um, uh, machine learning, have, they do have bias and interpret interpretability limitations, and you need to understand that. Um, uh, and what I mean by that is, as a user, we have to understand that. Uh, what, one of the things we found was integrating text analytics involves fundamentally rethinking uh, your data environment because things like lemmatization and various other um, things that you need to do to the data, uh, the text um, really is a different way of um, understanding data. And uh, the data's got to be fit for purpose. The algorithms will not somehow magically uh, fix all of the data problems. Uh, Pre-processing, we found that you just got to go through the hard grind. It's never per perfect in, in our experience. And we found that bringing experts in, data scientists, to work with our staff uh, in partnership, um, that's actually worked quite well with us. Um, so, but the last reminder there is uh, doing projects to discover potential is hard when everyone's busy doing BAU. Um, that, that's probably one of the hardest things because getting your subject matter experts to participate and getting the line areas to try and uh, get involved. The last thing I'll mention, I won't go into it too much, but suffice it to say that Australian government's considering the, the issues around human rights and ethics closely. Um, Dr Alan Finkel spoke on it not too long ago, um, and that's easy to find. Uh, one of the things that we all know is re-identification of individuals is, as far as I'm concerned, it's almost a certainty. If you get a disparate enough data set, uh, and I've got plenty of evidence, if anybody's interested, I can show you uh, scientific literature where they've been able to re-identify people using a combination of particular event, flights, and coffees bought at um, a particular local um, coffee shop. Um, so one of the things that we're going to have to deal with is, is the human rights implications, and, and that's certainly something that we're dealing with. I mentioned machine uh, bi uh, learning by verifiability, uh, the algorithm bias. I think it's worth mentioning that the public trust is really important. When you think about social complacency, which is a real issue, uh, and that is people are on one hand free to give their, they freely give out their data, but then you've got other events, Cambridge Analytica and a range of other things, uh, some government-based things that really erode the trust. So it's this really sort of, there's a dichotomy there around um, uh, social trust. Um, and, and we really, as from a government point of view, we have to work very hard not to break it and to build it. I will mention, and th there's a couple of examples here, but I've got stacks of examples. AI in health is just going nuts. The, and it's proving to be able to, they deployed it for um, looking at previous uh, um, uh, research papers, thousands of them, they've been able to discover things that are previously missed. Uh, again, because of time, I'm not going to go through it, but there are countless examples. And why I raise that is, is that if, if it's happening in the health system, it can happen across all systems. We just have to look for the opportunity. And in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, and I do apologise, it's a bit of a dry presentation. Uh, it's late in the evening, but really my message to everybody is the opportunities are there. Um, and we, as organisations, we, we have to recreate ourselves. Transformation starts before the technology. Uh, technology informs transformation. And, and I think, you know, um, we need, it's incumbent upon us as leaders, whether they're, we're thought leaders, whether we're senior leaders, uh, that we have to look for those opportunities to realise the benefits uh, that are waiting to be uh, taken up. Uh, and they are many. And, you know, I'm, I think on my presentation it talked about the future. All I've got to say is the future. Um, oh, by the way, that's just simply showing that uh, no matter what your plan is, uh, it's always uh, harder. So I look forward to the journey. And um, I'm going to finish up about the future. Dr. Albert uh, Georgi was a uh, Nobel laureate um, in 1937 around um, citric acid in the human uh, system. And he, he uh, was quoted as saying, discovery consists of seeing what everyone has seen and thinking what nobody, no, nobody has thought. And the reason why I like this picture is because the reality is there's this incredible wealth of data right in front of us. 
in, in text, in books, in, in all around us, information of, te um, of things, uh, uh, sources, and I would say to you that the future is whatever we want to make it, but um, my message to everybody is just have a go. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Tony will be around, I hope, for yes. questions. So we will go ahead with one more presentation and then we are going to make a um, minute break for everyone. Also, I forgot to mention that this session has been recorded and the entire night and also broadcast to the world. So you're not alone. Our next exciting, so thank you, Tony, for a very, very uh, interesting presentation. Our next presenter is Neil Bridget, who most of you know. Um, I met uh, Neil probably about six years ago when he was uh, at, maybe even longer, yeah, at Australian, which one, can I mention the name? Australian uh, <coughs> Criminal uh, Commission, the Crime Park Commission, and uh, as a data scientist, they're working on a very uh, interesting uh, thing that, that you usually can't about. talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, after that, I met with uh, uh, the person who actually engaged uh, Neil uh, in that arrangement, she was the CIO at the time of the place, and she once told me that uh, Neil was one of the most brilliant people she had met uh, in her life. And uh, I have to share, I, I used Neil's brain a lot of times to verify some of my thoughts, and I'm much on a less uh, uh, knowledge scale than Neil. Neil is now with Microsoft, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about the most <coughs> current uh, ways of utilizing AI and so on. So please welcome. <laughs> oh, that was very generous of you, Vlad. <laughs> now, just before we start, just something, Tony. I actually worked on the original GrantNet back in the early 90s. You can blame me for all your problems. <laughs> <laughs> you probably get the joke here. Yeah. When I mentioned that to your staff, they went, you worked on that? <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. I'll go Thanks. to the start. And right. So do, do I just, what do I press? Just you can just press here. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay. All right. Oh, thank you very much, everybody here, for turning up and donating some of your valuable time. time. I really, really appreciate it. it. And... I'm not, I'm not going to talk, talk too much about, about Microsoft. Microsoft, we, we, Microsoft, Microsoft has touched probably all your lives. lives. Almost, Almost everybody here probably uses Microsoft product once a day or once an hour, like, like me. me. Um, so, um, what, what I'm, I'm going, going to talk, talk about, about is my journey. journey. So, oh, there we go. So, so I, I, I actually, actually got, got my degree at the University of what's, what's called the Canberra College of Advanced Education back in 1982. And my, and my first, first job was actually, actually at the Department of Health. Health. And, <coughs> and, and, the, and, and I've, I've seen, seen a lot, lot of change in the, the industry here. And I hope you don't mind, mind. I'm, I'm going to share some, some of my story here. So, so because it's a 30 years, actually it's more than that, isn't it? 30, 30, 70, 36 years. Oh my God. God. Anyway, anyway um, so, so I've been, I've, I've stuck with the University of Canberra. And in 2004, I was awarded a master's degree. Uh, about 2012-13 I got my PhD from the University of Canberra in data science and looking at some, actually I was looking at messy data. I know you should clean it but I was actually, what happens if you can't clean it or what, what ramifications of that are. So I've, and, and I've worked for five law enforcement agencies. I don't understand how that's happened. I've worked for the Australian Federal Police, CrimTrack, the ACC, um, one I can't mention, and um, and the ABCI, which no longer exists, which is the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence. So, yeah, my next slide. And what I thought I'd talk about, you know it's 50 years since man walked on the moon. What's my little bit of involvement in it? I actually use that database they use. Does anybody know what that is? You can read the slide and see it. It's IMS, an information management system. Lo and behold, it's still used today. Department of Veterans Affairs still use it. I don't understand why. Um, <laughs> so one of, the, one of the interesting things about IMS, when I was a DBA and you came to me and said, Neil, I've stuffed up my schema. You know, all, we all know what a schema is. I, I created a first name, last name for a person's name. I 
completely forgot about the middle name because everybody has middle names, or some, most of us do. And so I would say to them, well, that's fine. I can add a middle name. Give me six months. I have to do a reorg. We have to test all the programs. And it would take six months to a year just to implement that one change. That's literally IMS. Fortunately, Oracle come around to SQL Server, DB2, all these relational databases where author tables add columns. Not, a pro not an issue anymore, but in those days, and Department of Veterans Affairs, to just modify the schema took months. It literally months. So, and that IMS was the database they used for Man on the Moon. It was the one that did the build the materials for the Saturn V rocket. Still in use today. In fact, most of the commercial transactions in Commonwealth Bank use IMS, believe it or not. So, I, I thought, I thought, now I'm a, I call myself a data scientist, Rowan over here is a data scientist, and he, he's, a, he's amazing, that guy. <laughs> I really respect you. And, uh, and what is a data scientist? Well, basically, what is a scientist? The scientist has a hypothesis and tests the hypothesis. And essentially, that's what a data scientist is. It's a person that tests um, some kind of hypothesis to validate it or dismiss it. That's what data science is all about. That's it. And to do that, we kind of need data. So the more data, usually the more accurate of the dismissal of the hypothesis or the rejection or the acceptance. And so that's why what Tony was saying is kind of important data is everywhere and and it's very important to us to use that data formulate ideas formulate hypothesis and just test them see if they're true correct or true or even from that maybe generate new hypothesis new ideas and that's what data science is all about um, it's changed a lot and I will actually talk through this talk what the changes are and also we ask lots of questions now this is debatable, in, even in Microsoft. I have, you know, Maria Molisevich, which uh, Vlad was referring to. Um, we were having a discussion: does a data scientist need a PhD or not? Rowan probably say they do. Um, so um, some people in Microsoft say they don't. And the other thing: we hate pie charts. <laughs> Did you know that St statisticians hate pie charts? So I, I. One of the changes I've seen is the data warehouse. The data warehouse has been around a long time, and it's basically the idea is you get your data, you cleanse it, you formulate these things, what they call star schemas or um, data cubes, if, um, and, and basically normalise the data or denormalise it in effect, and, and use that as your basis for your intelligence for your business. And you answer political questions, so when when the government formulates a po policy, they go to the data warehouse and that, and with that, they formulate some kind of policy. And, and perhaps what we're seeing now is a move away from that. I know Dharma is big into the data warehouse and, and I still think it has a role. And um, even internally in Microsoft, we're discussing what the changes of the role of the data warehouse is in, to the organisation. So the problem is there's more and more data sources now, you saw a picture of me. I, I should have spoken a bit more with m myself in front of the Hawkeye, uh, which is a military vehicle. That vehicle alone has 1,600 sensors on it. I've been doing the IOT work for it. And it generates data at a nanosecond. And you work it out. And we have to capture a, what we call um, a journey. Um, and they're roughly about eight hours. So if you do the math of that, that's so much data. So. Traditional data warehouses, even even SQL Server data warehouses, um, can't manage that sort of data, and we can't analyse it quick enough. We can't actually work out what the what the effect of certain conditions are. Like what happens when you go up a hill carrying a howitzer? They actually test that. That's some of the um, some of the scenarios they test. Also, what happens if there's an explosive device under the vehicle and it explodes? We, we actually blow them up as well to see what make sure that the people inside the Hawkeye motor vehicle survive. And the other problem we have, this is the, uh, uh, there's been a one of these each year and I just thought I'd throw it in. This is the B, Durham BI landscape now. As you can see, it's not very confusing. There's not much choice there. 
And that's not everything. That's 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 um, that. And you can see there's so much to choose for. And there's and now there's companies that are pushing certain technologies that we have end-to-end -end solutions now, such as AWS, Microsoft, Oracle, Google, IBM. They've all we've all got our end-to-end -end solutions. And so the dark, I, I pity you guys. You know, how do you manage it? How do you how do you go through that plethora of um, that plethora of uh, products? What do they do, and how do they solve problems? The other problem is we get this data, and, and it's sort of like this. Now we have 250 terabytes of data. That's fantastic. What can we do with it? Oh, well, we've got 250 terabytes of data. It's, it's just having data is not not the answer, is it? We need to be able to process that data. We need to be able to do something with it. And, and the next part of my journey, I've identified three types of people that look up. But we have the data analysts. Most people probably fit into this. I know ACO, for example, have <coughs> lots of data analysts. And basically, what they do, they can look at the data, but they're, they're more familiar with SQL. So they interrogate the data and discover relationships with SQL and just <coughs> doing that. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little bit of my frog in my throat. So that's, that's what I see that, and they use uh, SQL Plus if you're Oracle or uh, QMS if you're IBM, DB2. I tried to say through Microsoft products that are here. Um, but they, the, other, the other thing too is this new breed of people are coming along and they're the business intelligence analysts. And what I'm seeing is more and more people getting into Tableau Power BI, that's the best one of the lot. Um, that's the <laughs> <laughs> and also Oracle's offering. Um, <laughs> so and and very quickly, um, I, I see a move, and I don't want it to be disparaging here, and don't take this. Cognos, have you have you you're familiar with Cognos? One of the I think one of the problems with Cognos, I, I've had lots of friends who are Cognos report writers. You you go and ask. I would like to report. I want to see what the effects are, for example, in NHMRC of uh, research and what kind of benefits it has and so on. And so you want a, a nice report, you go to the Cognos people and, it, and say, because that's fine, it, it'll take me six months to a year to produce those reports. And out that top, it was quite, it, you need to be an expert, um, expert Cognos developer to be able to produce meaningful Cognos reports. And often they would be wrong. So you go to all the trouble in producing these reports and they wouldn't necessarily. Now, if there's anybody from IBM, I, I do apologise because they have got a new version of Cognos, which is much better. Um, but now, with products such as Power BI, Tableau, Oracle's offering, they, it's in now, anybody here can produce meaningful reports, as long as they're not FICA. Anyway, so, <laughs> so um, it's very... People now off the street can produce reports, dashboards, and things like that. Now we've got the next set of, I think Rowan, you're probably beyond this, but the data scientists. And they're then learning tools such as Python, R, Hadoop, Spark, these sort of tools, and even the deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow, the MPK, these sort of things. I'll talk more a bit about those as I go on. And they produce statistical reports. So they, they can. Um, they do qualitative, um, sorry, quantitative uh, research. So talking about research in, in uh, the respect to NHMRC, there's qualitative and quantitative. Now, data scientists are usually dealing with numbers, testing numbers with, um, uh, uh, with uh, testing hypothesis with numbers, either showing a correlation or not showing a correlation, or um, doing a prediction using some of the techniques that um, like a remark, if you're familiar with that, those sort of things. And what the data scientist is doing is we're starting from the data, we're moving to the information, we new from information, the data science now becomes knowledge. From knowledge becomes wisdom. We've still got a long way to go to the wisdom bit, haven't we? But, um, but with wisdom, you make hopefully sensible decisions. So that's, that's, that's essentially what the data science bowl is. And I was going I was going to show some of the some of the sources of data nowadays. This is the work on this is the open data. Now have you has anybody been to the open 
uh, the government open data tool. There's a, each day there's a new data set there, or probably 100 of them. And I notice now, like Northern Territory government, they've got a fantastic open data site. And, and you can go there and you can get um, figures on um, data on crime in the Northern Territory. It's interesting, they follow the same line as Chicago. Have you been to the Chicago Open Data website? They've got this fantastic data set of the crime in Chicago and they've got a book. Like each month they would have about 100 murders. In the Northern Territory, it's roughly about one a year, one or two years, so Northern Territory is quite safe. But these are the sort of things we're getting data from. We're getting it from the government, and almost every state and federal government, and even New South Wales Transport, they all have their own open data repository. Um, and, <coughs> and the ACT, if you want to know where the toilets are, there's an open data data source for that. So it's, it's all there. And we're getting it from things like Twitter now. So even drones are flying overhead taking video of us. There's more data. Data is everywhere. And it's, and it's exploding. It's, it's really amazing. This is uh, some work I did at the New South Wales government trying to identify cars. This, this is, there's 136 uh, traffic cameras in New South Wales. Majority live in Sydney. And we can capture the video and, and count the number of cars. More data. I'll skip that one. <coughs> so one of the problems with data, and I, I've seen this, is searching it. So there's no, we're becoming more and more um, developing superior search techniques to find the, the little gem inside the mass of data. Of course, there's more and more data searching is becoming a real problem. And we've got cognitive searches now. And we've got um, a lot of companies are investing. I, I know you mentioned Trove. Does anybody know what Trove is? Yeah, it's run by the National Library. I, my friend Kent Fitch actually designed it. He, it's, it's all the newspapers digitised since 1984. Do you know why they couldn't do it beyond 1984? Has anybody got a guess? Rupert Murdoch. He said he couldn't digitise it. He, 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 he put, um, you know, he exercised his, um, he said, because of copyright laws, the National Library couldn't digitise anything, any newspaper from one of these presses beyond 1984 onwards. It's a bit sad, really. <laughs> there you go. So he's affected Trove, even Rupert Murdoch. And so um, that uses a very sophisticated search alg um, algorithm to find the data. And, and people mistype names. They, um, <coughs> they have issues um, with, uh, you know, Chuck for Charles, things like that. So just searching data has become problematic. And so I'm, oh, this is very fancy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully this works. Yes. <laughs> Bit worried. So we have what I call the knowledge estate. And these are where we are now. So we have analytical tools, um, such as, and they range from Oracle's offering Power BI, which is Microsoft's offering, uh, Tableau, Quicklink Sense, all these fall into that, and Cognos, of course, fall into these ana analytical tools. And that, that includes R and Python to some degree, even though they fall into the machine learning. So machine learning tools, now they're, they're, they're growing every day. In fact, I'm struggling to keep up um, with them each day. Uh, it's, it's just enormous. And I'll, I'll briefly go through some of the more advanced ones uh, further in the talk. And now we're talking about intelligent storage. What do I mean by that? Sorry? One minute? Holy dolly. <laughs> um, well, I'll skip that one then. Um, I, I, I just thought, I, I'm, this is going to take five minutes if you could bear with me. These are some of my projects I'm working on. And some of them are a little bit sad. So I'm actually working at the Department of Environment and Science in Queensland. I, I, it's, we call this project Wally the Wombat. And um, why is this important? It's because there's only 200 northern hairy nosed wombats left in Australia, and left in the world. Yeah, it's sad, isn't it? And so we're closely monitoring them, and we have to actually individually identify each one. It's got to that point. There's only five viable males left. We suspect it's going to go extinct. So you're seeing the last of one of the northern hairy. You wouldn't think wombats would be that rare, but this is 
there's only 200 left, and it's not, if it wasn't for human intervention, they would have been extinct. Now, I asked the scientists, chief scientists there, why is that the case? And she said it probably isn't climate change, so, um, but it's probably hum more human intervention. Um, you, know, hum you know, getting rid of the, you know, urbanisation of humans, and, you, know, you know, that sort of thing. <coughs> so you, and they want to do individual ones, and they suggested facial recognition of wombats. Um, it's not possible. <laughs> um, we tried that. It didn't work. Um, so what we did was put little notches on their ears. So we put, you can put... It doesn't, we weren't allowed to put a tag on them, like an RFID thing, because it might affect their mating habits. So we couldn't do that. So we weren't allowed to paint them because sort of predators. You, you can't, you know, like that... They didn't want to interfere with them anyway. The only thing we could think of was putting little notches on their ears. You can, and you know, you can use a sort of binary pattern. Here we go. Oh. This is the, uh, I'm working at the Department of Environment and, Northern, and Natural Resources. It's kind of a weird department in the Northern Territory. Natural Resources is mining and environment. You, you, how do those two things fit together? It's a bit of an oxymoron. Anyway, um, they, they're worried about um, feral species in the Northern Territory, mainly cats. And we've put about a thousand camera traps up there, well they have, and we're capturing the data and trying to detect um, that's an antiquinus, which is a little marsupial rat. You know, they're, they're close to extinction as well. It's all very sad, isn't it, lovely? Um, so so we're, making, we're just keeping track of, you know, if, um, where they are and how many they are. I'm also working on Daisy the cow. What that is, the uh, Department of, uh, uh, Department of the, uh, Agriculture Victoria have bought some land around Warrnambool and they, they're discovering that the herd sizes have reduced for some reason. This could be climate change. So we're put sensors, we've got this thing called Smart Farm where we're putting sensors in soil to monitor the uh, moisture in soils plus flying drones over it and also um, keeping, you know, having various fields with various cow herd sizes and we're even capturing the urine of the cow. I'm not sure how they do that to be honest but I'm getting the data. I assume they're doing it correct. <laughs> so um, so that's Daisy the cow and um, actually if you're interested the, um, the, the milk um, the milk, uh, milk in Victor the milk industry in Victoria the dairy industry in Victoria has collapsed. So they're not being able to make they're not being able to produce milk at a cheap enough price um, compared to what you can get it from mainly New Zealand. The other thing I'm work, working on is the Australian Energy Market Operator with smart meters. I'll play this little thing. So this is... Oh, didn't play. Does that work? Uh, here we go. No, it's, is, it, is it still playing? It's a video, by the way, I produced. Ah, uh, well. So, what's happening, we're trying to do energy simulations, and we're discovering with the advent of solar on houses and wind generation that's simulating any, energy demands, because the Australian energy market operator, amongst other things, has to set the spot price of power, and have to be able to determine the amount of power produced per state. That's almost next to impossible now because in the good old days when you had 12 coal-fired power stations, it was all possible. But now with solar panels on people's roofs, wind, uh, variability of wind, doing these sort of simulations has become very difficult. So that's where we're, I'm working closely with AMO to produce the spot price. The other thing is New South Wales Transport. So we're looking at congestion management. I've been working with them. I'm going down there tomorrow to talk about work with them. We're trying to count the number of cars. These are all uh, roads in Sydney. Um, by the way, they, this is a real wicked problem for uh, New South Wales. Um, they reckon the CBD population of Sydney is going to increase by two and a half million people by 2040. So it's just going to get worse. And and people are going to, and they're finding it difficult, like Uber Eats, to get the thing, you know, your eats on time, and, and so it's hot and nice to eat. No, but 
lot of the stuff they generate is nice to eat, that's debatable. But anyway, um, they want, you want it there in timely fashion and hot. It's almost, it's going to be very hard. And, the, and because of, oops, one more, one more slide. <laughs> Promise. All right, this is a machine learning. What do these people have in common? Does anybody? Uh, <laughs> damn! <laughs> Somebody got it. You got it. So these people, none of these people exist. We use a machine. Um, we use a machine learning called Kras. Kras. That's how you pronounce it, I believe. To um, a friend of mine generated these images, and none of them exist. Pretty good, eh? Oh, well, that's that's it. Oh, my last slide was just questions. Does anybody have any questions before I sit down? All right, thanks. Oh, we've got one. I'm oh. very surprised you don't play a talented sport given you're such a good tennis player. Oh, d so. <laughs> 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 We're going back in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay, we unfortunately don't have time for a break that I promised you earlier, but let's, um, don't blame me. Okay. The next part, we have a presenter from Europe. That is Jovan Stojanovic. I'm just trying to get him on. Good evening, Jovan. Can you hear us? Hello, hello, yes, I can hear you. We can't see, okay. Can you uh, turn your camera on? Okay. Yes, of course, hi. Just a second, just a second. Let me just close the previous presentation and that's Jovan. Okay, so, uh, Jovan is uh, one of the AI pioneers in Europe, pioneers in Europe. He has started several city AI uh, locations in Europe and he's expanding it throughout the world. He has also been involved heavily in some interesting projects that I would leave Jovan to describe to you. Just to share with us what is happening around the world and what else you know, we could look at as examples of uh, AI use cases. So without further ado, Johan, you're on the screen, so. Okay, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Um, I will try to present my screen. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Nice. Uh, yeah, thank you, first of all, for a nice introduction, as I said, and for the invitation to uh, give a couple of insights about things, what we are doing uh, here in Europe. Um, yes, my name is Jan Stojanovic. I'm involved in a couple of uh, really interesting uh, AI activities around the globe. Um, right now, I'm a member of City AI, uh, where I will talk more about that uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, besides that, I am managing my young company that is in field of consulting in deep learning, mostly in deep learning. Uh, where one of our projects is actually a binomial platform for agriculture, where also I will explain a little bit what we have uh, achieved so far. Uh, it's pretty interesting industry, interesting area. Yes, of course, today we can find a lot of hype uh, around uh, artificial intelligence, um, where of course that uh, it's actually. And uh, really important for all of us to start uh, talking about the things, what are possible uh, ones, what are not possible, the scenarios, where we are actually going, and uh, some other also interesting uh, things. Uh, if we are talking about our community, City AI, we are one of the most active uh, AI communities around the globe, where uh, what are our actually goals? We are trying to help locals 
uh, to develop efficiently the, the, the different kinds of branches um, and education systems around uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we, are, we are not talking only uh, from the side of the technical implementation wise, okay, how to apply some uh, specific I know, TensorFlow model, etc. But we are trying to open some other questions from the side of the ethics, uh, from the side of the business modeling, um, education of other citizens, because it's really important uh, because artificial intelligence from my opinion is something that will really uh, change the, 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 the entire ecosystems around us. Um, if we are talking about our community, um, we, um, what's the name, is, uh, below that, city.ai, we are actually um, aligning that with the, with, the, with the cities around the globe who are recognized and who are interested to, to, to start with some uh, new chapters. Uh, right now, we are present in more than 70 cities around the globe uh, and actually continue to, to grow. Uh, we are present in all, on all continents. Uh, from states to, to, to Asia. Uh, we're uh, right now, I need to, to, to also announce something really interesting, and that is that we are actually uh, opening a new chapter in Canberra, also in Melbourne, uh, but uh, in Canberra, Vladimir will be one of the members where the idea is also to, to, to help locals there to connect on a totally new level and to help also in execution of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in different kind of models. Um, if we are talking about the, if we are talking about the city AI, uh, one of the really important um, events for all of us is actually our own conference that we are organizing each year, which is called World Summit AI, which is, I would say the, the most important AI event all over the world. Uh, and each year in Amsterdam from 9 to 10 October, we are hosting more than 6,000 people uh, from literally entire from entire uh, world, etc. We have experts uh, from uh, the biggest companies so like Facebook, Amazon, Google, etc. Uh, for example, we hosted speakers like Joshua Bengio, Lacoon from Facebook, etc. Um, it's really important to, to have this kind of events because um, um, one place you have uh, a chance to meet the, the most brilliant minds to network and to, to find uh, use cases that might be really beneficial for your company, for your team, uh, etc. Uh, if, we are, if we are talking about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, definitely it's uh, something uh, a lot of people say it's our last innovation. Uh, but I won't uh, say it like that. Uh, of course, there are, there are a lot of challenges, especially if we uh, can see in our global team there. Uh, okay, in the States, so you have a bunch of capital uh, that is spread it around the bigger players like Google, etc. The, the, the most active research right now is in the States. But we can see that in other segments like uh, Asia, especially China, uh, there's a huge potential and huge progress about some specific uh, use cases and specific domains of artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, report from PwC from 2017, uh, which is actually uh, talking more about the ratio uh, between the, the, the investment in, in um, actually AI and the, the, the GDP of, of, of uh, regions there. We are, we, what we can see is actually that uh, China is actually investing a lot in this kind of uh, approaches uh, entire AI ecosystem uh, where uh, of course there is a battle between the states and, and China in different kind of elements uh, but uh, from from perspective of Europe we are trying to find uh, our best use cases and our competitive advantage uh, we are in media, I mean, from people like Kai or Lifu, you can see, uh, actually he said a couple months ago that actually Europe is not a candidate for bronze medal in AI battle. Um, what's happening there uh, on the market uh, is a scene where a bunch of companies are actually investing a lot in uh, artificial intelligence and it's more like research uh, based, uh, research, re research based activity where return of investment uh, for uh, actually big number of those projects is uh, questionable and we need to, to, to find a way how 
we will actually scale our our projects uh, to the places actually where they will uh, create a real value and solve real problems. Uh, one of the of course bigger problem uh, problems is actually uh, of course related to data where from one side you have companies that corporates uh, the big ones who are looking the ways how to innovate and how to create some some uh, new values but in most of the cases what you can hear and what you can uh, see on the market is that those processes are pretty slow and uh, they're like dinosaurs really really slow in execution from the other side, you have researchers, startups that are looking for some new ways how to disrupt the market. But problem is how to find the proper data set. So we are based on that, we will be able to apply uh, really uh, an interesting model. Um, and in this communication between corporates and, and the bigger players like also government and the smaller ones is, is the key actually bottleneck right now. And what we are trying to do actually through our city AI community is, is uh, to also try to network and to, to, to merge um, some interesting stories stories together. Um, if we are talking about yeah, this is the rest of the world here. If we are talking about the industries uh, that are that are uh, really important for all of us, I would say the most important for me, from my point of view, is agriculture. And actually, we saw a bunch of different kinds of challenges in. The, uh, agriculture field and because of that we actually jumped in we, we, we wanted to, to solve a couple of things but uh, after a while we focused on some specific problem and um, if we are talking about the uh, problems why to, to, to push artificial intelligence in your culture you can find a um, significant number of really logical reasons uh, by 2050 where the world uh, will need to produce 70 percent more food globally according to Bank of America. And uh, what's really important for this is actually we will need to produce 70% more, but with less people in agriculture because it's not so like a modern, uh, modern role for young people, uh, for youngsters. And uh, from the other side, we need to produce more, but with less herbicides, chemicals, so with less water, because of course those kind of resources are missing as well. Um, also, we are having problems with steadily declining workers, as I said, in the main area. Um, also, uh, problems like incre increased concern over food security and labor availability, um, especially also in developed markets, actually will, will increase the in consumption of artificial intelligence. Um, right now, you, we, we have really interesting cases in Africa where AI is helping uh, with uh, some uh, to, to, it's helping producers uh, to have more like intelligent decisions and things are changing things are changing and this is really wonderful to see um, if we are talking about agriculture uh, here uh, artificial intelligence machine learning uh, you can find a bunch of different kinds of cases right now the most uh, most of the, of the usages actually you can see in computer vision problems uh, where drones are using uh, drones are used to uh, actually uh, scouting the fields and uh, analyzing what's happening there, uh, which is something that's really helping the, the, the agronomist to understand actually what, what's happening there. Also, we have a bunch of different kinds of agricultural robots, agribots, uh, that are helping in some really specific uh, use cases like spraying or, uh, you know, putting water uh, in a really uh, personalized, like, a personalized, personalized level. Um, what we are actually trying to solve as, as a problem uh, in our solution is actually a lack of benchmark analytical just-in-time recommendation. Uh, what uh, have we saw on the market actually that agronomists and uh, especially farmers are ex asking um, globally through the, uh, Google or uh, through different kinds of uh, other channels uh, for opinions uh, for the, they're, they're asking for help how to treat some specific illnesses. Because what's really uh, important to emphasize is that, of course, illnesses and different kinds of uh, diseases are actually also uh, growing uh, with a really aggressive pace. And um, actually, diseases that you have, for example, in states, um, or now you have in Europe, uh, etc., and vice versa. And things need to be more like automatized and more uh, like. Uh, 
faced with, uh, with some analytical thinking. Um, how we are trying to solve our, our, how we are trying to solve this problem, we are trying to solve this problem with controlled crowdsourcing of knowledge uh, powered by artificial intelligence. Uh, we develop a platform, a mobile application, uh, actually a system which actually connects uh, agronomists and farmers in a totally new way where you know, we like to say uh, for us that it's upward for agronomists where we actually help them to connect in totally new way but uh, other segment which is important for us is this feature as we call it second opinion why uh, you should only have one agronomist or one opinion uh, you can have a couple of them and based on this crowdsourcing of knowledge uh, our algorithms are also learning uh, better about uh, some specific recommendations which are given to a uh, farmer. Based on that, what we are also trying to succeed there is also benchmarking of different kind of uh, chemicals that are used uh, for some specific condition, which is really important because uh, right now in the market you have like more like salesy approach, uh, it's more like commercial approach, uh, which is not sustainable and uh, it's not like aligned with these challenges that we have. Uh, as I said, like 70% more food in the next couple of decades. Uh, when we have this platform where we combine and actually we help in communication between agronomists and farmers, as I said, in a totally new way, uh, where our system is actually using uh, AI in a place actually of plant disease detection and, and verification, where our application is able to help you uh, in a way where you can take a photo of some uh, leaf or so, of, of some plant and our algorithm will uh, give you a recommendation of what's actually happening, what's happening there on, on that photo. Uh, and if we are confident about it um, and we understand what what's happening, uh, we are able to give you like a recommendation how to treat it. Uh, if not, you are able to ask agronomists and to get this controlled uh, crowdsourced uh, intelligence uh, from them, which is really important for us because we have this human in a loop, as we like to call it, uh, feature, uh, which um, from my point of view is something really important for us, but also for other AI systems, uh, because we, with that, uh, models are uh, more like, um, uh, models are learning more progressively about some stuff. Uh, but when we have confirmation, okay, right now we have this disease on the plant uh, and we understand what's happening, we are trying actually uh, to understand like a wider area uh, of, of that, of that uh, region uh, where what we are actually doing is actually understanding of uh, like weather conditions, uh, some, some also soil conditions, some other stuff that are really important for understanding why some specific uh, disease is actually uh, happening there. Uh, based on those information, we are able to give a prediction uh, of the movement of that disease, which is really something important for other farmers because they are able to get like um, predictions uh, like upfront alarms about uh, okay, some specific illnesses is, 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 is coming and uh, you need to take uh, attention to it. Um, one of the, of the, if we're talking about the technical aspects, of course, the computer vision uh, is an uh, area where right now we have a bunch of really, uh, really, 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 a bunch of really uh, good uh, products, uh, actually models are working properly. What we are actually doing is the classical convolutional network software, um, where is our hack? We are um, actually able to understand a little bit better uh, what's happening there, but with less data. Um, that's one of the segments. The second segment is we develop our own internal solution for labeling data in a totally new way, which help us to understand uh, what's, what's happening there. Uh, we don't need a significant uh, amount of, 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 of images uh, to be able to understand what's happening there. Of course, so right now what we are uh, working on is, um, is the part where uh, we are trying to, to, of course, from the one side, collect as much data as we can, uh, but also to uh, specialize uh, for some specific illnesses uh, where our focus right now is more on food, 
uh, fruit, uh, like fruit and, and, and vegetables, uh, where uh, with that we are able to understand a little bit more of what's happening, especially if you're talking about the fruits, uh, we have understanding um, for uh, apples, uh, for a couple of more, more um, uh, fruits like bananas, uh, uh, ears, uh, etc., which is uh, something where we have the most use cases so far with, with our clients. Um, core theme around this, we have the uh, theme, which is the experience. Uh, Marco is a deep learning expert and PhD with more than uh, 10 years in the industry. Also, we have uh, more than 14 engineers that are uh, from the software development side, but also from the data science side, uh, where they are able to help for some specific uh, cases. Something which is really important for us is uh, that we got uh, support from the Christoph uh, Auer Belbert, who is a partner at IBM Ventures, who is our advisor on this project. Uh, if we are talking about our steps and actually where we are right now, uh, something that I really need to emphasize is that actually we uh, just closed uh, one uh, government uh, client uh, where we are working with one ministry of our agriculture uh, in implementation of this particular solution uh, for uh, their farms and their farmers. Uh, they find it as really something that is helpful for the entire ecosystem. Uh, our idea we are focused on the Europe market where uh, we are also looking for partners who are able to help uh, this market in the future. Uh, where our idea is also to, to uh, open new chapters on other continents, other other markets as well. Um, so we are not me, alone me. with this, so actually it's really important if you're talking about artificial intelligence uh, to have the main partners, the main knowledge partners who are in the industry who are able to give you more like inside information about what's uh, happening uh, below and uh, it's on specific here uh, where we have really interesting interesting partners uh, from the alliance of agronomists in the um, united kingdom to companies like by and by john deere a pioneer a dupont uh, that are actually in this region here uh, we also have excuse me Ellen. With, uh, Ellen, we will have to finish soon because we're running out of time uh, can you summarize your thoughts just please yeah, of course, a couple of, of more slides. So one of the projects which is actually also important for us, where we would like to invite you as well, it's uh, my own uh, summit, Wonderland AI Summit, uh, 8th of November in Belgrade, where we are also hosting some lines. We have a really interesting video here. Uh, we are hosting, for example, head of data science of Mercedes, uh, guys from IBM, uh, from Max Planck Institute, from eBay, from really a bunch of, of, of big, big players. Uh, also, Vlad, I would like to uh, give a couple of free tickets, uh, exactly five tickets, uh, free tickets for, for your listeners, for your people there. Um, you can find a way how uh, you would like to organize that. Um, and yeah, this is really, really important to, uh, for us, and we would like to have all AI minds together with us there. My last slide is, yeah, in Shropkin. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much, Jon. Uh, Jon will receive any questions or email. Uh, we are going to now to the last speaker of the night, which is uh, Tony Boyle. Can you come join us, Tony, please? Thank you, Jon. Thank you. Tony? Yeah, ready for you. Tony Boyle, uh, I have many years of experience with Tony. We used to work uh, together with Oracle, and we are now together with Andrew, part of a, an interesting project uh, addressing some government challenges that Tony is going to talk about. Tony. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I know I'm the, the last speaker, so we'll, we'll make it quick. 
and hopefully for as well. So we're a, a fairly new company. We're a partnership. Uh, came together with mostly data people from many years back, if you, you look at the three of us. Uh, but we came together to, to answer a challenge from the Australian government as part of the, the business research and innovation initiative, which is a great scheme. It's run by the Department of Industry now. Uh, and that challenge was the automated creation and application of digital record authorities. Now, I'm led to believe that most people in this room will understand what a record authority is. Uh, yep, uh, I didn't. Uh, but I'm not from Canberra, I'm, I'm from Melbourne, so I didn't know what it was. Uh, so it's been a fascinating journey learning what that is, and even more fascinating learning how they're made and, and the difficulties that go into that. Uh, but what the government wanted us to do, or challenged us to do, was to develop an accurate and scalable way to decide the value of government assets, okay? uh, but to automate that. At the moment, it's, it's an entirely manual process. Uh, it's a long time, it's quite expensive. They wanted to automate that. Uh, now, spoiler alert, we haven't done it. We're only, we're only looking at it, but uh, it, it will take a while. So we're working at National Archives, which have, have been terrific, really helpful. They've told us everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you know, we've learned a lot from them. They had a number of requirements, and they had a number of drivers as well. Uh, clearly, the first driver was the, uh, the Archives Act. That's what we follow. That's what we must do. Uh, of course, they wanted good quality information. Uh, the, the key one here is replacing a labor-intensive, expensive uh, manual process. So to create a record authority, they, they showed me the process map of how you do it. And I said, well, that must take you weeks to do that. And nah, that takes months to years to create one of these quite complex documents. There's a lot of to and fro There's a lot of working with agencies, with other departments. It just takes a long time. Uh, the person that starts the process may not be there at the end. So there's, there's a lot of risk involved in it as well. Uh, but the key requirement here is deliver a smarter way to discover, evaluate, and preserve information vital to Australians and Australia. So we had a look at this and we came up with our vision because everyone needs to have a vision. And we wanted to create an automated reasoning system to enable organizations, not just national archives, not just the government, uh, but all organizations that need it, uh, to create a digital instrument. In this case, it's a record authority uh, based on the business rules, the processes, and ontologies. Uh, to process the information assets, and information assets can be anything from an old document to an email to a, you know, an annual report using semantic analysis uh, to create a signature of that document. So we, can't, we don't all have the time to read through every document again and again, but we'll give me the signature of that. What is it all about? It encapsulated in a nutshell for me. And then derive the value of that information. Is that information valuable to us? Uh, do I keep it? Do I throw it away? Do I keep it for five years? Well, what's the value of that based on the business context? So what I may find valuable, you won't, for example. Uh, what's the status? Who is it about? What are the entities in there? Are there people? Are there organizations? Uh, what's the relationship with other assets? So that asset on its own may not mean much, but in the context of something else, uh, in relation to another document, it becomes quite valuable information and we want to keep them both together. Then we have to determine what information is relevant and, and also why it's relevant as well. Uh, so we, we apply different perspectives to understand the environment and around it. And you know, that might be through you know, my perspective. And I'm coming from one department. Somebody else is coming from another department. They will look at the world in a different way and, and derive different information and different value from that document. Uh, we want to describe that environment as well because 
remember that we have a document today that we may not look at for 10 years when we decide to keep it or throw it out. We need to remember what's happening today because that's the context in which the document was created. So if you look back on documents created uh, 30 years ago, you know, they may not have been very valuable, but that was the time of the Tiananmen Square incident. Uh, the documents could be related to immigration. Uh, so an incident in another country had a huge impact on Australia because Bob Hawke, if you remember, uh, allowed 32,000 uh, Hong Kong res or Chinese residents that were here to stay here. So it had an impact, something that happened in another country had an impact on us, uh, changed the face of our population to, to a large extent as well. So little things within a greater context can mean a lot. That's why we're trying to capture this. Now, humans are great. They can look at that and say, oh yeah, I remember that. And uh, that's really important, or that's nonsense. Uh, and we had a, a bit of a debate with National Archives yesterday about you know, those little blips along the, in a long time in history. Is that important or not important? Uh, whatever perspective you come from will make a difference. Uh, it, we had some principles for ourselves when we started with this. You know, what, what, what do we care about? And always it's good quality, relevant data. Now, good quality data, that's a given. But relevant data, what does that mean? Well, when you look at documents that are created within government, there could be a hundred of the hundred documents that are all very similar. You know, ninety of those are noise, ten are important. We want to keep the ten and kind of strip out the noise. Because in the future when somebody comes to research or, or get some information about a period in time, you, you don't want to throw everything at them, you want to give them the relevant information. So trying to find that's important. Uh, single source of information. We don't want to replicate documents. We don't want to replicate data. Uh, we want it metadata driven and have a single source of information. Uh, knowledge maps built on taxonomy, natural language processing, and the key thing is automating the resource intense, intensive tasks. We are not going to automate everything. The process is long, it's complex, it depends on humans, it always will. We, we cannot automate all of it. So we did all that, and then we came up with a super solution, which is very just a simple version of the solution, uh, and the most colorful one as well as we can. But let me walk you through it, because it's very simple. First of all, we, we read the documents from wherever they are. It doesn't matter what store they're in, it, you can read almost anything. Uh, then we build the taxonomy, we look for the control vocabulary, the keywords, what, what are people talking about. Uh, then we analyze the documents to understand the context. What's that document about in, in the broader context? Then we generate that record authority. So this is the record authority that applies to that particular document. Uh, next one is we determine what's the value of that asset. Okay, based on the context, based on the content, based on the, on the record authority. What do we believe is the value of that? And then, at some point, we determine what's going to happen to that document. Do we keep it? Do we keep it forever? Do we keep it for 20 years? Or do we chuck it in the bin? Now, it looks very simple, but uh, I'll break it down for you. We've got a number of inputs. There are information assets, legislation. These are the two key ones, the experience and the knowledge that the people have now. We have a whole bunch of components there, uh, semantic tagging, ontologies, taxonomies. These are all built with, uh, you know, valuation engines, taxonomy construction engines, and so on. Uh, we have technical outputs like lenses. So how do we look at it? What's the perspective, and so on. And then the real outputs are the classification of the document, the information value, and finally the retention determination. That, that's why we're doing this. So look at a couple of those quickly. Uh, controlled vocabulary. I, I'm looking at that because this is about that size. So excuse me if I turn my back on you. Uh, so 
The control vocabulary is a, it's a list of words and phrases, and they're a, a data dictionary, uh, the function index, what's the functions of, of that department of government or that, that uh, government function, we can uh, put them in there and we need to refer to those. Taxonomies are the big ones, that's naming and classifying the items into, into groups or categories. And I'll show you an example of how we do this. Uh, Taxonomies are, are logical arrangements of multiple hierarchies, subjects. And when you, when you get a document, you have to compare it against a taxonomy, or, or maybe more than one taxonomy. So, for example, if you had a document about a, uh, a decision in the high court, you know, the, the logical taxonomy there is the legal one. But if it's about a tax matter, then it may be legal and the ATO will be interested in that as well. And if it's about uh, tax fraud, then the AFP will be interested in it too. So you'll have one document, you have to determine which category it fits into, is it one, is it two, is it three, or multiple. And this is a perspective thing. Uh, you know, who's, who gets what out of that document? The ATO will get something, and the AFP will get something. Uh, ontologies are, are collections of taxonomies. So we want to look at the broader picture, no, not just the AFP view, but you know, what else is going on in the world. Uh, that person that was in court, have they been in court before? Are they a repeat offender? Are they a foreign national? Uh, are they a foreign government influence? We don't know. Th this is where we have to map things out uh, with this with this ontology. Uh, when we got this challenge, we looked at a few different ways of doing it. We, we looked at you know, keyword searches, which are great. And we didn't take a long look at it because David Fricker told us not to, because he, he'd seen this one before. Uh, but we did consider it. Uh, statistics, you know, for using machine learning, it's great if you had a trained set of things. Uh, pattern matching, is up to a point, uh, so we went for the, the deep semantic analysis because it is its words, its phrases, its sentences, its entire documents. You need to understand it all together. Uh, the features of our system, which is yet you, you to be fully built, so uh, we can get data from virtually anywhere. Okay, different types of sources. It doesn't matter where your documents reside. Uh, using our artificial intelligence for text understanding and analytics, uh, AI algorithms that mimic as much as we possibly can human ability to read and understand. Uh, and, and this is important because there's, there's an example that Vlad uses. If you see the word leg, what is it talking about? Is it the leg of a person, the leg of a chair, uh, the leg of a two-stage football game? Uh, this is where the context comes into it, and this is where the keywords fall down. Uh, we need to automatically categorize content and extract entities. That's what I was talking about earlier. It's, we extract an entity of a person or an organization or a thing. Uh, who is that? Uh, where else do they occur in, in the map of the world? Uh, if that is an important person over there, do they lend a greater weight to our document that we have in our hand now. Really important. Also, detecting relationships and facts involving the extracted entities. In other words, if that person is not terribly important, uh, but he is the CEO of a company that may be important, uh, we need to know that as well. So it, it's going at levels and levels and levels down until we can find you know, something to, to tick, tick a box. Uh, benefits, you know, better information is, is, is a key benefit. Uh, increase efficiencies, uh, reduce risk of the loss of significant information. This is what National Archives is, is very worried about. Uh, free up the knowledge work. And so the real experts within National Archives, let them do their job, you know, you know, let's get the laborious stuff and the manual stuff out of the way and they can use their expertise. 
Uh, but most important, I, I think, is to legal legal legacy of rich information for future generations. Okay, not leave a, a mess, but leave some really rich uh, curated information for future generations. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much. This completes the program for tonight. Um, I am just going to introduce you that we plan to have another session. I hope you like it. Dahama and I am always welcome new members. Feel free to pick one or both, ideally, and join us not only to be part of these events, but also to give us more content give us some ideas, what can we do better, what can we do to uh, go uh, provide you with better, better and more appropriate knowledge about hot topics. Thank you very much for your patience, thank you for coming with such a great numbers, and I hope to see you on... Oh. Someone should have told me. That's danger 